Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for being here today. What a good way to start a new year, right, with worshiping our Lord and Savior. We're here to worship God. We call it a worship service because we're here to worship him. I stand behind the altar, which reminds us of Christ's sacrifice. On the altar is God's word, the Bible, because we regard it as his word. And we fellowship together because Jesus has said, uh, you are my sheep. I have called you by name and you are mine. So we are here to worship God. And thank you for coming here today for this worship. Uh, by way of announcements, I hope that you have a bulletin. Uh, we have uh, a sermon outline and even our, the words of our last hymn are in the bulletin. So make sure that you have one of those. There's a few announcements there. Uh, but uh, first of all, a couple of other announcements as we begin. There is a, a fellowship time with coffee and cookies downstairs today, so please join us for that and take some time uh, to fellowship. Uh, also, as I assume most everybody has heard by now, next Sunday, January the 8th, is the first Sunday of our new pastor. So uh, we want to spread the word and make sure everyone is here and to give Pastor Zach and Heather and their young son, Leif, um, uh, a warm welcome uh, next week, so pray for him too. Um, uh, it maybe doesn't need to be said, but I guess I'll just take this opportunity as, as uh, the last Sunday before our new pastor starts, pray for Zach and Heather. You know, they're younger people. He's had a year of ministry down in Wellsburg, Iowa. Pray for them, bless them, invite them into your home, take them out to dinner. Um, uh, you know, maybe, maybe babysit so mom and dad can have a date, uh, things like that. But I know that our congregation will give them a warm welcome and remember to pray for them. Also, by way of announcement, uh, you may have heard on the prayer chain uh, about a week ago that uh, one of our uh, regular worshipers here, Harriet Johnson, had a, had a heart attack. Um, she is doing very well, however. She was in United Hospital for about four days. They put two stints into her, in her heart. I talked to her yesterday on the telephone, and she said, I'm as good as new. <laughs> so praise God. Uh, you know, she's, um, let's say, past her 80th birthday, so uh, we always are glad at that age to have more years to come. She is in Menominee uh, temporarily uh, living uh, with her grandson, uh, Jeremiah Turner, and his wife. They said, Grandma, come live with us for a while. We have a nice apartment in the basement. So she's recovering and taking cardiac therapy and uh, you know, recovering, but uh, continue to pray for Harriet. But bless God, we easily could have lost her. She had a heart that was 90% blocked. Um, and um, so Harriet has been given a lease on life, and, and uh, she said, everybody that came into my hospital room heard, Jesus lives, celebrate Christmas, do you know Christ? So, they, so she, she used her time and united well. Um, any other announcements that we should give at this time? Um, we have the symbols of Christmas still around us. I guess I'd like to think that Christmas is not over. Christmas has just begun. And that we can keep Christ alive every day in our hearts. And so if one of these poinsettias is yours, we have some plastic sleeves. You can take it home after the service. Um, but we'll be singing some Christmas carols too. And you see Christmas bells on the, on the front of the bulletin. I'd like to think that we're just beginning. And we're looking forward to Epiphany, right? On, on January 6th, the coming of the wise men. Uh, so we're still celebrating Christmas a little bit today. Shall we begin with a few moments of silence? Heavenly Father, you are the Lord of the universe, our maker and sustainer, our savior and God, and every bite of food we eat, every sip of water we drink, every time we inhale, we receive your blessings and your provisions. So Father, we're here to worship you and thank you in this service today. And as it says in scripture, my soul wait in silence for God only. For my help is from him. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. Father, we aim to give thee due reverence and holy fear. And so, as sinners, we come before you. 
But we thank you, Lord, that Jesus paid the price for our sin. So we don't have to live today under those burdens and saying yes to those temptations, but we can live with the victory of Christ. But as we enter your presence for worship, Lord, we think about the words of David in Psalm 24. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord and who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart. Lord, you are the only one who can clean us up on the inside. And so by our confessions, we ask that you would do that very thing. And we lean on your promises, Heavenly Father, that says, if we confess our sins, God, you are just and righteous and faithful and will forgive us our sins and will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we call to mind our sins. Lord, give us a sensitive heart for your Holy Spirit because we cannot live close to you or in your joy and power unless we live in your purity and admit that we have need. And we worship in the name of Jesus Christ, the one who has forgiven us and restored us and lives in us today. Amen. Our call to worship is these words from Exodus 34 and Psalm 95. The Lord God, compassionate and gracious, God is slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth. God is the one who keeps loving kindness for thousands. He is the one who forgives our iniquity, transgressions, and sins, and yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. So come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving, and let us shout joyfully unto him with psalms. O come, let us worship the Lord God, our maker. For all who are able, would you stand please, and we will recite our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. It is in your bulletin, but it's also at the back of the green hymnal, number 717. Uh, more often we recite the apostles, uh, but we believe in the truth of the Nicene Creed also. Shall we confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed? I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and I believe in one Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Would you remain standing, please, and greet one another in the name of the Lord, and then our hymn after that, remain standing, please.
If you will take your hymnals, if you will take your hymnals, please, we have number 128. We will sing just the first and the last verse only. 128, just the first and the last verse only. Again, just the first and the last verses, number 131. Just a reminder about our offering also. Uh, we're still not passing an offering plate, uh, but at the back we have the box if you should feel so led to give. And thank you for your faithful giving congregation throughout the year. Our consistory gave us a report last week that uh, the giving uh, has been adequate to meet all the needs of our congregation. Thank you. Our Old Testament scripture reading is from the book of 2 Kings in chapter 6. On the Pew Bible, if you like, it's page 389. Be reading from the Old Testament, God's Word, 2 Kings, chapter 6, about the prophet Elisha and his servant and Israel and what they did when they were under attack. I'll begin reading with verse 15 through verse 23. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. O oh my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid. The prophet answered, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed. O Lord, open his eyes so he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked, 
and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And as the enemy came down toward him, Elisha prayed to the Lord, strike these people with blindness. So he struck them with blindness as Elisha had asked. And Elisha told them, this is not the road, and this is not the city. Follow me and I will lead you to the man you are looking for. And he led them to Samaria. After they entered the city, Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men so they can see. Then the Lord opened their eyes, and they looked, and there they were inside Samaria. When the king of Israel saw them, he asked Elisha, Shall I kill them, my father? Shall I kill them? Do not kill them, he answered. Would you kill men you have captured with your own sword or bow? Set food and water before them so that they may eat and drink and then go back to their master. So he prepared a great feast for them, and after they had finished eating and drinking, he sent them away, and they returned to their master. So the bands from Aram stopped raiding Israel's territory. This is the word of the Lord, and together we say, thanks be to God. Shall we pray? I thank you, Lord, that we can come to you like a child to father or mother. You know already, Lord, what our needs are and that you have asked us to ask. And when we have the humility to draw near to you, Lord, you have said that you will draw near to us. When we confess our sins and when we admit our need, when we ask for the needs of ourselves and for the needs of others. And so, Father, because you are our Father, because you are the God of all power, you are able to answer every need. And because you are the God of all love, you are willing to do so. Because you love us. And you have given us the gospel that Jesus did for us what we could never do for ourselves, and that's clean ourselves up on the inside. And so we praise you, Father, for the gospel today, that as it says in 2 Corinthians 5, that he who knew no sin became sin on our behalf, that we might receive the righteousness of Christ. So, Lord, we are aware that in one way we don't have to come to you for anything because you know our needs and you've already given us salvation and eternal life. But even for these needs of ourselves and the needs of others whom we love and know here on earth, uh, we do ask today. I thank you, Father, for sparing the life of Harriet Johnson, that you uh, very obviously have other plans for her other than the heavenly kingdom, that there are things you want her to accomplish in the earthly kingdom yet, and we praise you for that for sparing her life, and we ask, Lord, for her full restoration. Heavenly Father, we pray for Zachariah and Heather and Leif DeWitt uh, as they prepare that there would be safe travel in their move this week. I pray, Lord, you would bless and anoint them uh, for ministry, that you'd give them every gift uh, for successful service here. Help us, Father, to remember to pray for them and be a blessing to them and, and honor and submit to him as our elder authority. Father, we pray, too, for an end to the war in Ukraine. Uh, Father, I pray for Vladimir Putin. Uh, I pray, Lord, that you would send Christian people across his path, even face-to-face, courageous Christians in Russia, who, like Saul of Tarsus, could hear from you, Lord, the message of love and forgiveness and transformation. Lord, we want to pray with that confidence that just like you saved Saul of Tarsus who hated the church and was killing Christians, that you can save and restore Vladimir Putin into a place of being a born-again Christian. Father, we pray for the people of Ukraine, especially our brothers and sisters, uh, that you would spare their lives and bring this war soon to an end. Heavenly Father, I pray for those among us who have recently been bereaved. I think about Dale Hudson and his family with Marlis's home going and for Dory Schofield and Dave and all the family with Bruce Dahlman's home going. 
Father, that you would comfort them, and as adjustments are made, uh, that you would uh, give them uh, your words of truth. And if there are any in these families who are not serving the Lord Christ as Lord, that you would draw them, even in a time of grief, uh, unto full salvation. There are so many that have needs, Lord. We pray for revival in our country. Father, that uh, churches would begin to grow again. There has been revivals in other places and in other centuries. Father, we ask you to be stirring in people's hearts, stir in our hearts that first reformed of Baldwin could be a lighthouse for those who hurt, could be a place of an open door for those who are seeking you and that all who enter these doors would find you. We pray this in Jesus' name. And now let us pray together the Lord's Prayer as Christ taught his apostles to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our next hymn is number 152. You may be, remain seated. Uh, in your green hymnal, number 152, I heard the bells on Christmas Day. We'll sing all five verses. Our New Testament reading and our primary text for today's sermon is from Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, and verses 13 and 14, reading from the King James Version. The setting was Christmas Eve, 2,000 years ago, and in the dark of night, the angels, uh, pardon me, in the dark of night, the shepherds were in the fields. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will toward men. This is the word of the Lord, and together we say, Thanks be to God. Shall we pray? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, your word is true. We're banking our lives on it. 
And we're banking our souls on it because, Lord, by your gift of faith, which has been brought into each of our hearts, we have become convinced that 2,000 years ago, there was a little baby born in a manger who was God himself in human form. And he spoke the truth and walked on water and healed the sick and caused the blind to see and put his arms around repentant Pharisees and prostitutes and lepers and said, the kingdom of God is for you. And then he died for our sins and rose again from the dead on the third day and 40 days later rose again into heaven. Lord, on the basis of your word that details these things, we place our trust in thee. And Lord, we admit that we need your sacraments. We need your salvation. We need the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. We need the encouragement of your scriptures so that we can live as your people today. So that we can live as Jesus said, my desire is that my joy would be made full in you here on earth in the middle of a cesspool of sin on this fallen planet that we like Jesus can live holy lives and lives of joy and lives of victory over sin. So Father, the words of scripture that we've just read and those words of scripture that I aim to preach faithfully, that because it is your word, it's not just a word, your word is life. Oh Lord, give every saint here your life today. That this day and this month and this year, because it's a gift from you, that we may enjoy it with all your other good gifts that you have given us and shine as lights of Christ in this world. Strengthen us, we pray. Thank you, Father, that you have promised to do this very thing. So in you, we can rest. In Jesus' name, amen. So 2023, we have to practice writing. If you're like me, sometimes I have to erase it a little, get used to the new year. Aren't we blessed to live in Baldwin and Woodville and Hammond and Roberts and Spring Valley? There's no war going on. COVID is very much on the decrease. I think most of us, maybe our whole lives, have never had to go without food because we didn't have food or money to buy it. <laughs> We're blessed. We're so blessed, aren't we? We have the freedom of worship. We have health. Many of us are enjoying long lives. Uh, many of us have been blessed with Christian spouses and with children. These many, many blessings we have received. And yet we know that last year we all faced challenges didn't we? As individuals, as families, as a congregation, as a denomination, as a nation and world, we all face challenges. And we would wish that 2023 would be a clean slate, right? And it is. Um, but we're still going to live here on earth, so we know prepare for challenges. Prepare for challenges. But God has not left us alone to face those challenges, but has given us his strength and his spirit and his word and his comfort. And so even in this world where there are still things going on that can be hard challenges, how can we be people of hope? You know, when we have hope, we can live strong in the most difficult of circumstances. But when we ourselves have been at a place without hope, or when we know someone who doesn't have hope, we can stumble and fall over the smallest of troubles, can't we? Hope is really key. The Apostle Paul said, faith, hope, and love, these three endure. So my prayer is that you will find something of hope to grab a hold of in these words from the angels to the shepherds 2,000 years ago, because I think those are words of hope for us too. First of all, glory to God in the highest. Secondly, peace on earth. And third, goodwill toward men. The words of our hymn that we just sang, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day, were written by the famous poet Henry W. Longfellow. Maybe you studied him in American literature. He was a Christian man. Read about the guy. He had faith. 
as of last week, um, that was the anniversary of him writing that song, as you can see, obviously, from the lyrics, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. Henry W. Longfellow wrote the poem on which that hymn is based in 1864. If you know something of U.S. history, you know that the Civil War was going on. Like us, Henry W. Longfellow had faced some challenges. Years before his first wife, Mary, after they'd been married only three years, died in childbirth. He went through some struggles, Henry W. Longfellow. He was a widower for eight years, and then he met another wonderful Christian young lady by the name of Frances. And they were married for 18 years, but one night there was a terrible fire in their home and she perished. Henry tried to save her and was badly burned, and she died. When the war started, Henry W. Longfellow was very much against the war, but his oldest son, Charles, insisted on joining the fight and considered it his patriotic duty. In the middle of one of the battles, Charles Longfellow nearly died. A bullet came within a hair's breadth of his spine and left him critically ill. So Henry W. Longfellow took his adult son into his home and was a full-time caregiver. So on that Christmas day of 1864, he felt burdened. And I think we would have too if we'd have been in Henry's place. So he was sitting in his house feeling downcast, as we can see from some of those verses. I actually put all the verses in the bulletin because we don't sing them all in the hymnal. But when he heard the church bells ring, he began to walk back toward God by faith. That was the day when people didn't have wristwatches and only the rich had a clock in their house. And when worship was about ready to begin, they would ring the church bell. And that was the warning to people who were members of that congregation, saddle up the horse now if you want to get to church on time. <laughs> so when Henry W. Longfellow heard those church bells ring, I put them on the front of our bulletin today for that purpose, he returned back to faith. So like Henry W. Longfellow facing the challenges he faced in his family and facing the challenges of the United States Civil War, how can we help from being infected or affected by the hate and the pessimism around us? How do we respond when maybe our child's or grandchild's school teacher is a lady who has a lesbian wife? How do we respond when maybe my coworker or when my boss at work is a Muslim? How do we respond when our next door neighbor thinks there's something wrong with that person? They go to church every Sunday. What's wrong with them? <laughs> Sometimes we're in that spot these days, right? Today's text reads, the words of God's angels, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly host, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest. The first thing, glory to God in the highest. I believe that courage that endures and hope that is strong begins when our eyes are opened to who God is. In our text today from 2 Kings 8, Elisha's servants looked around at the armies of the Aramean enemies surrounding them and got scared. If we would have been there, we probably would have felt the same thing, like, 9,000 against two, what kind of odds are that? There might have been 40,000 soldiers. The Bible doesn't tell us. But what did Elisha do? He prayed, oh God, open the eyes of my servant. It all starts with glory to God in the highest. When the servant of Elisha's eyes were opened, he saw in the sky thousands and millions of God's angels and chariots of fire. They were not outnumbered. May God open our eyes to the fact that we are not outnumbered, that one person plus God is always a majority because God is so big. Someone has said, don't tell God how big your problems are. Tell your problems how big your God is. <laughs> because when our eyes are open to how big God is, how powerful he is, how loving he is toward all, then our problems will shrink in comparison. 
So the angel said, first to the shepherds, glory to God in the highest. Keep God in that high place of reverence and power and authority. The angel's second word to the shepherds was this, peace on earth. Maybe this is where Henry W. Longfellow got stuck for a while. I don't think any of us have lost two spouses to tragic death. I don't know that any of us have been a caretaker for an adult son or daughter who's paralyzed and needs 24-hour care. None of us have lived through a civil war, I know that. And so Henry W. Longfellow, maybe he asked that Sunday morning as he sat in his home discouraged, where, Lord, this Christmas is peace on earth? Outside his window, in the hills and valleys of America, 700,000 young men lost their lives on our soil. The people who lived through that and were Christians, what did they think was happening to their country when it was being torn apart by death and civil war? So when the angel's message was peace on earth, Henry W. Longfellow and us would ask that question, Lord, how can I find peace in the age of anxiety? How can I find peace in the age of strife How can we find peace when there's immorality around us and God's word seems to be disrespected? I think part of the answer, too, is we need to see that there's a difference between inward peace and outward peace. Outward peace would be peace in our circumstances, the outward events of our lives in this world, whereas inward peace is peace in our heart. What kind of peace was Jesus talking about when he said, In me, you will have peace. The first century Jews, I think, made a mistake when they thought about the Messiah. If we see those uh, movies of Jesus or or, uh, the Chosen, uh, we realize that many of the first century Jews living at the time of Christ, walking this earth, they made a mistake when they thought about the Messiah. Many of them thought that Messiah was coming to deliver them from the brutal Roman rule. But actually, Jesus came to deliver them from something else and to give them something better, and that was to deliver them from sin and hell. And so we may have a mistaken view of what Jesus is here for, too. You and I today maybe will think that Jesus is supposed to make us comfortable, or Jesus owes us success or wealth or popularity or being well-liked. But I think actually Jesus came to give us something better, and that's he came to deliver us from self-interest and from self-sufficiency. God is looking, I think, for men and women today who love him so much that they are willing to suffer for his sake and the gospel and to serve in his harvest fields. We may hope that this year everything will get straightened out. We may hope that the war in Ukraine will end We may hope that if every one of my bills would get paid and if I would get a raise at work and if I would get a new boss or a new job, then everything is going to be rosy. But I think those are the vain hopes of outward peace. All those things of outward peace are vain and fleeting. We enjoy them when they come, but sometimes they don't come or sometimes they're followed by another difficulty or challenge. But remember Jesus' word, I did not come to bring peace but division. It's one of the most peculiar phrases in the Gospels, Matthew 10, 34. Jesus said, I did not come to bring peace, but division. Or some translations say, but the sword. The Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 11 that divisions are actually inevitable. And he was talking about in the church. And why are those things, divisions, inevitable? I think partly because the devil is real. The devil is our enemy. How easy it is for us to get in strife with people. Every once in a while, someone's going to hurt us to say something or do something that denies our dignity, and we feel hurt. Our feelings are trampled on. We're disrespected in some way. But maybe we can remember that hurt people hurt people. The person who hurt me, probably somebody has hurt them worse before. And really, truly, we have only one enemy, I believe the Bible teaches, and that's the devil. 
Satan is our only enemy. So we don't have to be in strife, losing our peace with respect to relationships with people because only the devil is our real enemy. Remember that occasion when Peter was looking right at Jesus and when Peter heard Jesus talk about going to the cross, suffering, torture, being killed, Peter, I guess out of sympathy, didn't, you know, he was speaking out of common sense, Jesus, this will never happen. Stop talking about that rubbish, we might paraphrase it as. And what did Jesus say? He turned and looked at Peter right in the eye and said, get behind me, Satan. There was some strife in those moments between Peter and Jesus as to what should happen next. But Jesus didn't ridicule Peter. Jesus didn't say to Peter, you're being stupid. Jesus addressed the real enemy, get behind me, Satan. And so the battle is the Lord's. We don't have to be in battle against the devil in one way. Someone said that if the devil knocks at the door of your house, say, Jesus, would you mind getting that? Because God's gift to us is inward peace. Jesus said, abide in me and you will have peace. Yes, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. God's peace in me. You will have peace here. How was it that Jesus, in the boat on the Sea of Galilee, in a fierce storm, could fall asleep in the stern on a cushion? Because he had peace in here. And we too can fall asleep and be at rest fall asleep in a good way, I mean. (laughs) Have God's rest and peace, even in the middle of the stormy circumstances of the United States, whether it's immorality, whether it's bad movies, whether it's, no matter what it is, whether it's dishonest neighbors or the crime rate or whatever it is, God is greater, amen? If we know Jesus, if he's living and king in our hearts, if we allow him to be king in our hearts, we can live even here on earth Anyone can smile like Harriet Johnson when things are going well. That lady was smiling in United Hospital and she had all kinds of tubes coming out of her chest (laughs) because she carries the happiness of Christ with her. Jesus said, I give you peace, not as the world gives. Remain in me. So, glory to God in the highest, peace on earth, and then the third word, Goodwill toward men. Is it possible to live with goodwill toward people who are not like us? Is it possible that we could be expressions and embodiments of God's goodwill, even to people that hate Christianity or think we're stupid or think we're dumb for being against abortion? Um, Yes. Goodwill toward men was the angel's words toward the shepherds. As we submit daily to God and as we humble ourselves and as we walk in his strength, As we strive against our besetting sins, then God comes to be alive in us more and more. Jesus said, I am with you always. And when we're tempted to holler back, just whisper a prayer inside our soul, Jesus, if retaliation needs to be done, you're going to take care of it. I don't have to be against that person or that situation. Because Jesus is always up to the job of helping us, is he not? He's able, and he's able to make us able. And Jesus said, with God, all things are possible. Maybe it's true, I don't know, but years ago, Christians, I think, were oftentimes in the majority. If you lived here in Baldwin in 1920, let's say, probably everybody on your street went to church someplace. Now a lot of us, we feel like on Sunday morning, we're the only one in our neighborhood. (laughs) We're not in the majority anymore. So today, if we find ourselves in the minority when it comes to beliefs or morality, when we, like Elisha's servants, seem to be outnumbered, what do we do? How do we behave? I have eight points of application here because it's not that we just want to hear the word. Like Harvey Hilkema used to always pray on Sunday mornings with the pastor before the service started, Harvey would always pray these same words powerful words, Lord, help us to hear the word. And after we've heard it and received it, help us go be doers of the word. (laughs) So let's be doers of the word. How can we be doers of the word? How do we behave when we're in the minority? 
First of all, three things that we can avoid and need to avoid if we're going to live lives full of hope and be, and be lights of Christ in our neighborhood and workplace. First of all, don't be a pessimist. In the book of Numbers chapter 11, as the Jews um, were leaving Egypt and had crossed the Red Sea and were, and were in the desert, the Jews began to complain, and Moses did too. Read Numbers chapter 11. Moses too began to complain, and what was the whine? Why, God, are you being so hard on us? <laughs> Have you ever said that to God? Guilty as charged. Maybe you too. Why, God, are you being so hard on me? <clears throat> but that doesn't belie faith in God, does it? God is here. God is powerful. God is on our side. And so actually it's unseemly, it's unfitting for us to be fearful or fret because God is in control yet. So don't be a pessimist. Secondly, tradition. Sometimes tradition is almost a dirty word in our churches today. <laughs> um, and if it's a man-made tradition, yeah, let it go. But three times in the New Testament, we're told, hold firmly to the traditions. 1 Corinthians 11.2 and twice in 1 Thessalonians, hold firmly to the traditions. Now, what does that mean? <laughs> does that mean having communion every Sunday or the pastor wearing a robe? What kind of things are we talking about here? I think it's talking about um, that there are God's truths and God's unchanging commandments that ought never to be changed and can never be changed, should never be changed. Those traditions that were designed by God, we must hang tightly onto. But those traditions that are designed by man, those we can live without, okay? So we are commanded to hold tightly. Do not abandon the traditions of the church. I think it's so important in, other, in, in order for us to be people of hope that we need to live stable lives. I don't think there's anything wrong with liturgy. Because in a changing world, I remember one time years before Sandy and I met, and I was going through a time of depression. And I felt like God was a million miles away. And I couldn't even pray because there was so much mess going on in my mind and heart. But at night before bed, I prayed the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I lived alone, and some nights I just shouted it out, and it was like the walls got echoing. But I could fall asleep. I'm so glad for that tradition. Jesus said, pray this way. It's not magic. It's not, it's not a magic wand. But some of those traditions, when we don't know where to turn, like a tradition of being in church on Sunday morning. Isn't that a good tradition? Because we're always blessed when we worship with a sincere heart. Third thing not to do is don't be unsettled or surprised about the existence of evil. We live in a sinful world. It doesn't help anyone if we get angry at them for going to an X-rated movie. I think they've done the wrong thing. They've filled their minds with junk, garbage in, garbage out. But it doesn't help them if we get angry at them. So let's not be unsettled or surprised at the evil around us. Remember that most unbelievers are not really unbelievers by conscious choice. It's by default. God's word says Satan has blinded the eye of the unbelievers so they cannot see. So we can pray for them like Elijah prayed for his servant, God, open their eyes. Because if they can see God for how big he is, how compassionate he is, how powerful he is, they'll be changed. And if we're living the life of the light of Christ, maybe they might even ask us a question. And with gentleness, we can respond. So don't be a pessimist. Don't neglect the traditions. Uphold them. Don't be unsettled or surprised by the evil around us. Now five things we can go ahead and do. Five things that will help us be God's expression of goodwill toward men. Bless those who curse us. Pray for those who despitefully use us. 
do good deeds to those who do rotten things toward us, act in love toward our enemies, bless. Bless someone this year. Bless your spouse. Bless your children. Bless your neighbors. Bless your boss. Bless your pastor. That's a privilege and a command. And we find that if we're blessing our enemy, it's pretty hard to hate them anymore. <laughs> if we pray for those who are our enemies, it's pretty hard to hate them and to wish them ill. So we can be people of hope. We can be people of goodwill if we bless others. Number five, be a good listener. James 1.19 says, slow to speak. Boy, that's got to be the hardest word in scripture for me. <laughs> that's the trouble with Sunday school teachers. Uh, be slow to speak, quick to hear. If you see the children's coloring page back there, I put the children's one with a large ear. When was the last time that you and I last listened, really listened, to someone who deeply disagrees? I'm pro-life on abortion. When was my last conversation where I listened to somebody who was pro-choice? We don't have to agree with them, but do we sincerely listen? Not just debating in my mind what my next argument is going to be, but listen. We bless someone, especially our enemies, when we listen. Number six, speak the truth. Ephesians 4.15 says, speaking the truth and in love. God expects us to contend for the faith, Jude verse 3. Earnestly contend for the faith. When we are relating to people, when we feel we're in a minority, um, when we're the only one in a crowd or a family or a workplace or a neighborhood, pardon me, it's easy for us to go, I think, to one of two extremes, both of which are wrong. One extreme would be to just hammer them with the truth and walk away. You know, to be harsh about our beliefs and the standards of scripture, that would be wrong. It's good to speak the truth, but we also have to do it in love. But sometimes we go to the other extreme. We're so gushing with love and emotion and compassion and nothing but grace that we forget to speak the truth to the person who needs to hear the truth, and we sometimes never get around to speaking the truth to them at all. Ephesians 4.15 brings those two things together. Yes, do speak the truth, but do so in love. It is possible to love the sinner and yet hate their sin. It is possible to tolerate people but be intolerant of sin. Number seven, God's word tells us repeatedly that we are to treat with gentleness and kindness those who are around us. It says in 2 Timothy, the Lord's servant is to be kind to all. And that includes the neighbor who doesn't think much of us. That includes the person who disagrees with us about gay marriage. That includes the person who thinks our denomination should go a different, generation, a different direction. God's word says the Lord's servant must be kind to all. Kind to all people, kind in all situations. And the last one, number eight, we are not to harbor a grudge against anyone. Instead, we are to forgive Seven times, 70 times, 70 times seven, may God help us. We can only forgive by his grace, right? Genuine, real, deep forgiveness. We can say, I forgive you, but to really, truly forgive and return to loving relationship with someone who has hurt us, now that takes God's grace. So we pray for it, but we can forgive because God is able to help us be able even toward those who are rude, even toward those who misunderstand or falsely accuse us, when we truly trust God, I think, we can let him settle any scores that need to be settled. In our call to worship this morning, I read from Exodus 34, 7, where it says, God said to Moses upon, upon Mount Sinai, giving him the Ten Commandments, I am God. I never will leave the guilty unpunished. We can trust God. That if somebody needs to be punished and they have it coming, God will do it. So let's enter this new year as people who are full of hope and full of God's love toward all. Yes, there is violence in our world. There's cancer. There's hypocrisy. There's school shootings. We, I'm not saying we have to be naive, right? But there's something greater. God, the greater one in us. When we encounter um, these kinds of problems, when we have a tendency to get angry at someone. Jesus' apostles came to him 
and said, those people over there, uh, those Pharisees, they're wrong about religion, and people are following them. And what did Jesus say in Matthew 15, 14? Let them alone. The apostles, I think, wanted Jesus to go to those um, false teachers and read them a riot act. And Jesus, because he was perfect, sometimes he did rebuke them. They had rebuke coming. But for us and for Christ's disciples, Jesus said, let them alone. Maybe in today's vernacular, Jesus might have said to us, don't let the turkeys get you down. (laughs) Let them alone. God is able, and he is able to make us able. So your best days can yet be ahead. Even if we're 50 or 70 or 91, your best days in terms of fellowship with Christ at a deeper level can still be ahead. Do you believe that America's best days can still be ahead? I think so. Because of who God is. Our nation has many stumblings. Our nation has many problems. Some of our politicians, I think we all think, are doing a lot of things wrong. But because of who God is, we can always have hope that America's best days can still be ahead. Our best days can be ahead. Let's be optimists, not because of the power of positive thinking, but because of the power of our God. Read church history and you will find places like in the 1800s in Wales where there are powerful revivals. In Wales, there were lots of pubs and lots of prisons in the 1800s. But a revival swept through the country. Thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands were born again. The pubs closed because nobody wanted to get drunk anymore. The jails closed because people weren't committing crimes. They laid off hundreds of judges, the government of Wales, because the judges were sitting in the courtroom, no crime to prosecute. It can happen. Let's pray faithfully for revival in America. God's grace... God's power is real. We may be tempted to give up on God and ask him, why are you allowing this to go on, God? We may give up on a friend. Won't they ever change? I've been waiting 10 years. (laughs) We may even give up on ourselves, saying, when am I going to get out from underneath this thing that's bothering me, this habit that I can't get rid of? But because of who God is, like the angels to the shepherds, it is possible that we can know and give glory to God in the highest. It is possible that we can experience inward peace on earth. And it is possible that we can live with good will toward all men. Even when we feel outnumbered, the truth is we never are. Because one human being plus God is always a majority. Amen. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you speak to our hearts. We have human ears and tongues, but Father, you are the one that can gather us toward you in the deeper sense, the sense that's eternal. And so I pray, Father, that you would apply these words from Scripture to our hearts. Help us, Father, to walk with peace, to walk with hope and faith and joy, because you are here and you are the God of all power and love and mercy and you are in us and you are working with us and we pray in Jesus name amen would you stand please the lyrics for our final hymn are printed in your bulletin just that one um, just that one verse of this is my father's world Would you stand, please? I guess you are standing. If I get my glasses on, I can see that. (laughs) This is my father's world.
worship. If you can, please join us downstairs for some refreshments. Receive now the benediction of our Lord from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 15, verses 13 and 14, these words of benediction from our Father. And now, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Because, brothers and sisters, I am convinced that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and you are able to encourage one another. Amen. We have gathered here to worship God in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace to serve the Lord. Amen. Our dismissal hymn is the doxology.